As we continue in our series on the seven outpourings of Christ, this is our final sermon in this series. Um, Last week, just to bring to your remembrance, we talked about Jesus' blood, uh, or how Jesus bled internally for our unforgiveness, for our hurts, for our emotional wounds. We shared how he was whipped for our diseases and sickness. And then we also talked about how the crown of thorns was placed upon his brow, signifying the curse of poverty and the fact that um, Jesus does not want us to live in poverty. And I shared with you the fact that poverty or that wealth is not necessarily the things that we hold in our hands, but the things that we hold in our hearts. And, um, And so today we want to continue in this series and talk about the fifth outpouring. And the fifth outpouring is seen in the nailed, pierced hands. When they took Jesus and they, they led him to Golgotha's hill and they laid him on that old rugged cross, they took his hands and as they stretched him out, they began to put the nails into his hands. He willfully allowed them to do that. It says to us, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Do you understand what I've just read to you? In the Garden of Eden, when God created Adam and Eve and all living things and made this beautiful earth, He said to Adam, I want you to be in authority over everything. You are to be in dominion. You are to control it. You are to name it. You are to be in charge. But what happened? Shared with you in a, in a, a previous message that, that Adam lost his willpower because he said, I want my will and not God's will. And he yielded to the forbidden fruit. And because of that action, the world was cursed. God was saying to Adam and Eve, I want you to be in charge, I want you to have authority. But because of the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden, they lost that authority. They were cast out of the garden of Eden. They were to live in poverty. They were to live under a curse. They lost that authority and Satan became the God of this world. I want you to notice something, though. When Jesus willfully went to Golgotha's cross and they stretched his hands and they nailed the stakes in his hands or in his wrists, wherever it was, he was winning back to you and to me our authority. I want you to think about that for a moment. He was winning back our authority because he said, here I am, take me. He was shedding his blood for our authority. Let's think about the hands for a moment. Hands have meant a lot. Hands were used for blessings. In biblical times, the father would place his hands upon his children and offer blessings unto them. Hands were used for prayers of anointing. In Acts chapter 6, we read, These they have presented to the apostles, who after prayer laid their hands on them. 
Hands were used for healing in Acts chapter 9. And he, referring to Saul, had seen in a vision a man named Ananias enter and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight, so that he might be healed. Hands were used for God's continual blessings. In Acts chapter 13, verse 3, Then after fasting and praying, they put their hands on them and sent them away. Uplifted hands were used in our worship and prayers, or in, in worship and prayers. I desire... Therefore, that in every place men should pray without anger or quarreling or resentment or doubt, lifting up holy hands. So in our worshiping, we are to lift up our holy hand or lift up our hands in gratitude to an awesome God. Hands were important. There is authority in the hands of God's children. And I believe that Jesus let them nail his hands to the cross to win back our authority. And you know what that means? That means we can bless our children. We can bless our children with the laying on of our hands. And that's important. That's important. We can bless others. We can pray with others. And there's something about a touch that means, it says volumes. It says, I care about you. It says, I love you. And with the laying on of our hands and the pleading of blood over someone, we can, we, we can pray for their healing. We can bless them in Jesus' name. And what great opportunities and blessings that that can bring into our lives. Redemption blood is a powerful thing. We can lift up our hands to worship to the Almighty. Have you done that? Have you done that? And maybe you're in the house and you're walking around, you got some music playing, and, and you're just in, in, in the spirit of worship. And you just, you just lift your hands up to God in worship. Or you're praying. And you just, you just lift your hands up. Say, oh God. Oh God. Here I am. The second, or the, the sixth outpouring. And it kind of goes along with, with this same thought. So I want to just carry it through. But the sixth outpouring is seen in the nail-pierced feet. In the nail-pierced feet. In the Garden of Eden, we lost not only our authority, but we lost our dominion as well. And, and, and that word can be used interchangeably. But our dominion, is po it, our dominion to possess and to be in charge. And I believe the nail-pierced hands, or the nail-pierced feet, has to do with our walk. It has to do with our walk. Throughout the scriptures, we are exhorted to walk uprightly, to walk in God's ways, to walk in holiness. Jesus shed redemption blood so that we might be able to walk the walk that he wants us to walk. Listen to me, church. God shed his life on Calvary's cross. He allowed them to pierce his hands. He allowed them to pierce his feet so that you and I might be able to, to walk the walk that He wants us to walk and to live the way He wants us to live. Are you living a holy life today? Is your life pleasing to God? Can you say this morning, I am. I know beyond a shadow of all doubt that I am a child of God. I've accepted Him as my Lord and Savior. He is my King of kings and my Lord of lords. He is the master of my life. Can you say that unreservedly today? That He truly is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God told the children of Israel 
that every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. I love that story of, of Joshua and the walls of Jericho. Remember that story? Remember how the children of Israel had to march around Jericho once a day for seven days, and on that seventh day they had to march around it seven times? What were they doing? I'll tell you what they were doing. They were claiming Jericho. They were claiming Jericho. They didn't know how it was going to happen. They didn't know what God was going to do. But they knew that God was going to do something. And on that seventh day when they began to, to blow the trumpet and they had marched around it seven times and they shouted, the walls came tumbling down and victory was theirs. You know, my Bible tells me that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The God that, that knocked down the Jericho walls, the God that divided the Red Sea, the God that brought miracle after miracle after miracle in the Word of God is the same God that lives today. And He is the same God that wants to do miracles in your life and my life. But you know, I think we fail so often in this whole concept of the blood, pleading the blood over someone's life. God wants us to take dominion back. God wants us to take the authority back that we need to take back. What would happen? What would happen if in, inside the four walls of your home that you began to, to walk around every day inside your home and you began to pray? And you go to the bed where your, your spouse sleeps or, or the bed where your children sleep and you begin to put your hands on that bed where they lay their head every day, every night. And you begin to pray and you begin to plead the blood over them and over their soul. What would God do? I'll tell you, Satan would have to flee. You go to their chairs where they sit at mealtime and you just put your hand on the chair and you begin to just pray and you plead the blood and you say the name of Jesus and you tell God that, that you long to see them Give their heart and their life to God. The God of miracles would hear that prayer. And I believe that's why Christ went to Calvary's cross. Not only to do a work in our life, but to give us back that authority and that dominion that God wants to give to us. What would happen if we began to walk around, march around our neighborhoods, pleading the blood? Asking God to visit us with revival. What would happen if we began to march around our schools and say, God, you need to do something in our schools. And I plead the blood over the kids that come to this school. And I plead the blood over the teachers that teach in this school. And God, we want to win them for you. God, do the miracles that need to be done. What would God do? What would God do if the Christian community would wake up and say, hey, God wants to do something in our churches, in our communities, in our nation. And if every Christian church that preaches the word of God would get their people fired up and say, hey, let's begin to plead the blood. Let's claim what God wants to give to us. And take the authority that God wants to give to us. What would happen? I'll tell you what would happen. God would begin to move in our midst. He'd begin to move. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm, I'm excited over what Christ did on Golgotha's hill. He willfully gave His life to set us free so that we can claim back the authority and have the dominion that he wants to give to us. What would happen if in the jobs that you're working on, maybe you're working on a vehicle that just you're having problems with, 
And if you just take a moment and you just put your hand on it and say, God, in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood over this thing. Give me the wisdom, give me the help I need to do it. What would happen? I did that the other day. I got my power washer out, and that crazy thing wouldn't start. I yanked, and I yanked, and I yanked, and I yanked on it. And, you know, being the fat, chubby man I am, it didn't take too many yanks for me to get out of breath. And I just said, God, I don't know why this thing don't work. It's got gas. I primed it. You know, it's been sitting all winter long. I knew that. But I said, God, won't you just get this thing going for me? Help me. And I pulled it a couple more times, and that thing fired right up. I just said, thank you, God. Now listen, I'm not a wacko, okay? Well, some of you are questioning. I I got that, I got that, okay. Maybe sometimes I am. But, but I just think we serve a God, and, 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 I, and I shared this with you the, the, the other week, we, we, we serve a God that wants to give us peace, and a God that wants to give us joy, and a God that wants to do miracles in our lives, and a God that wants to reveal himself unto us. A God who, who says, hey, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. A God that is here for us. And yet if we just sit back and, and, and we don't pray and, and we don't talk to Him and we, we don't ask Him for things, He's not going to do anything. The Word of God says, ask and it shall be given unto you. Ask. And, and, and it also tells us, you don't have because you don't ask. You know, if your kids don't ask you for stuff, you're not going to give to them. Our grandkids know that when they come to, to, to Grandma and Grandpa's house, they ask, I want a drink. Now they're kind of getting to that place where sometimes they get a little demanding. Get me. Uh, oh, yeah? You know? But they ask. I need a snack. And they always need snacks. But, hey, that's okay. But if they wouldn't ask, they wouldn't get. Well, they would eventually, but you know, you know what I'm saying. We're more apt to give it to them because they ask. Well, so... So it is with God. God says, ask, and it shall be given unto you. So look, I, I really think there's, there's power in the blood of Jesus. The seventh and final outpouring is seen in the pierced heart inside. It says in the Gospel of John, the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and broke the legs of the first, and the other which was crucified with him, referring to Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. The seventh and the last place Jesus shed his blood was where the soldiers shoved the spear into his side, and blood and water poured out. Jesus died so that you and I could be forgiven. He died of a broken, a crushed, Heart. The sin of the world was placed upon the Son of God. 
For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I want to tell you something, church, something that you've heard many times, and that is that Jesus Christ went to Calvary's cross so that you can have eternal life. He paid the ultimate price for your sins and mine. It wasn't the nails in his hands and feet that kept him on the cross. What kept him on the cross was his love for you and for me. The songwriter penned it well when they said he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. You see, when a person died on the cross, it normally took several hours for them to die. They would not die from the pain that they were enduring from the the nail-pierced hands and feet. But what killed them was exhaustion. And not only the exhaustion, but what happens was when they kept using their feet to push themselves up with to take a breath of air, it would be excruciating very painful, but their, their weight of their body would fall on their lungs, would be pressing against their lungs, and they couldn't get air, and they would die because of lack of air in their lungs. And that's what would kill them in most cases, and that's why they broke their legs so that they could no longer push themselves up, and so they died suffocating to death. What an awful way to die. What a terrible way to die. But when they got to Jesus, he had already died. So they stabbed him with a spear. And the word of God says blood and water flowed out. But I want you to notice what Jesus proclaimed. In the synagogue before his crucifixion, Jesus said this, he got up to read, and he read from Isaiah, but he read this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Little did they know what he was saying. But he was saying, I'm, I'm going to, I'm here. I'm here with a mission. A mission to set you free. A mission to set you free. And when he was stretched out on that old rugged cross, and he willfully surrendered himself, he didn't struggle. He didn't fight. He didn't argue. He didn't say, no, don't do this terrible thing. He willfully, willfully surrendered his life so that you could be set free. And my question to you in the closing moments of this service is to simply ask, what will you give to him? What will you surrender to him? Would you, will you give your all? Will you totally surrender everything to the Lord Jesus Christ who has given so much to you? Again, I just want you to know he paid an awesome price. Not only to set you free, not only to give you uh, an eternal life, but to help you right here, right now, to experience joy and peace. And to win back the curse that was lost in the Garden of Eden. He paid the price to set us free. Are you willing to give him 
You're everything. Will you stand with me? Let's just bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, in the closing moments of this service, I lift to you these wonderful people. And Father, only you know who needed this message this morning. And Father, I pray that you would speak to each and every heart that is here. How awful it would be to go to a devil's hell by way of the church. And so, Father, help us. Help us in these closing moments of this service to just search our hearts and to ask ourselves, am I truly, truly born again? Do I truly know Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior? Have I truly surrendered everything to Him? God, it certainly is worth the journey. It's worth everything that it costs to follow you and to live for you. I thank you for the joy and the peace that can come into our life. I thank you for the power that we can have and we can take that authority and and we can claim things through the blood of Jesus Christ and through your name. And Father, I'm so glad that you are a miracle worker, working God. Thank you for how you answer prayer. Thank you for the joy and the peace that is ours. Thank you for the changed life. Father, I pray now that as we go our separate ways that you'd go before us. Give us a good, tri- a, a good day today as we travel home. And I pray, Father, that, that you will bring us back safely tomorrow or next week as we come together to worship you on this wonderful, wonderful Sabbath of celebrating our risen Lord and Savior. Bless your people, I pray, and for all that you do, we'll give you the praise and the glory, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.